friends. It's Binge O'Clock, the podcast where we watch something and then we talk about it. I'm Joy Selden, and I've seen almost everything. I'm Danielle Nga, and I've seen almost nothing. I'm Nella, and uh, I should have prepared something to say. Uh, wait, I'm looking around my desk for something. I love maps, and I, I hate the introduction of aliens when you're big, bad, or alternate universes. There, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Just get that out up front. We're not even going to shy away from it. Oh, it's so true. <laughs> and in this episode, we are discussing Fringe Season 2, Episodes 4 through 6, where we experience so many things. <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde dreams, aliens, as Nella pointed out, and man, am I having trouble pinpointing something for episode four. Hybrid soldiers? Well, yeah. flatworms? Oh, uh, LSD alternate reality trip? Fake Charlie dead? <laughs> uh, fake Charlie went out like the swear jar. She is. Like, uh, fake yeah, Charlie's there dead. it is. There's the first <laughs> swear jar of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I'm not up to at least $50 worth of swear jar at this point, I, you're doing I'm not, something wrong. I, precisely. <laughs> Precisely. Listeners, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea how hard it is to go back and like count all my swear jars in time I for saw- each recording. <laughs> <laughs> I really need I- to keep a better running tally. <laughs> I swear I'm editing as fast as I can. <laughs> That's a little uh, peek behind the curtain. We uh, we do give ourselves a, quite a bit of wiggle room to uh, record these, so we have a little bit of a backlog in case you end up like me, where now it's my busy season at work and uh, I just don't have time to watch things. Meanwhile, Danielle and I, it's just like, would you like to watch something? Yeah. Sure. Pick yeah. a night. Do it. That, that's my secret <laughs> cap. I never have time to watch things. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is why I never finish anything. One mm. one reason. I mean, listen, I, I maybe I've said this before. So, Joy, if I have, you can nix this again from the record. But if you drop off after season three of this show, I'm not going to blame you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I still feel like I'm I'm kind of in it. I'm in it to win it. You, you have to at least start season four because you'll end season three and think, what could possibly happen next? And right. then the beginning of season four will hit you and you'll have to make a decision. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I sound so aggressive about that. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, and it's it's one of those things where like now because we're doing these alternating weeks and because we've actually lessened the amount of episodes we're watching – Season two is going to run a little longer than I expected. So again, if you're like, I've spent five months on this show and I'm good, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I won't. I won't be mad about it. Look, it's okay. I just, I just need to survive until October. <laughs> no, I think we can do it. Do you want to jump right into the aliens? Because look, here's here's what <laughs> the first thing I said at the top of after we finished watching these, which is that I see we've hit the doldrums episodes with fillers because maybe you shouldn't have killed my son, Charlie. Mm-hmm. Hear me out. And I think it really shows. Uh, I, I th- These were fillers. Not so much episode four, but five and six. I, it's, yeah. I'm looking over my notes and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what happened. And we just watched these like last night, you know. Episode four drops a lot. I'm trying to pinpoint the fringe science in episode four. It's like trying to hit a cat with a balloon. All right, you know, I okay, tail. I gotta, I gotta Running talk down about, the hallway. I have to talk about flatworms. So the whole flatworms thing is the time travel problem. You can only go one way. So, like, he set up the scene. Walter has blended flatworms because flat worms transmit memories. Yes. And we're when trying ingested. Yes. And we're trying to trigger Olivia's memory of what happened. When you feed a flatworm to a flatworm, <laughs> that flatworm gets the memories of the eaten flatworm. <laughs> you do So it again, it's like the time travel problem where it, it, the whole idea is that you can go into the future, you know, if you hang out on the edge of a of a black hole because time is deeply affected there, and, and then you can, like, leave and you've been gone for 50 years. Uh, but you can't go back in time. <laughs> I mean, we, listen, Peter agrees with you, Nella. <laughs> yes. But, like, I mean, he does. Olivia still takes that worm juice sh- sh- shooter like she's it's her very, job. She's desperate. Yeah. She's desperate for anything. Which is why she also continues to see Sam Weiss. I know. Although, can I just say, 
I, I understand Walter's kindness of he was going to try <laughs> to hide the flavor with strawberries. <laughs> but having once thrown up strawberry daiquiris, I don't – and to the point where I, I can never look at – even look at a strawberry daiquiri again in my life, I really can't imagine what a strawberry would taste like with a worm. <laughs> no. I, Maybe just <laughs> enough strawberries. I mean I don't want to gross anyone out, but I think he was just trying to match textures. <laughs> you have a point. <laughs> And I hate it, and I hate your point. I'm not grossed out. I just love that you thought about it that hard. I'm now trying to get the 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 sensation of worm and strawberry out of my mouth. I don't know how you saying that coated my tongue. I'm sorry. The brain is very powerful. I just got That's kicked. okay. You know what? We can move on from that to this actually works. Huh. Huh. <laughs> well, I have a question. Do you actually think it do you think it worked or was it just coincidence? Because at the end of the episode, this one or the next one, she goes to Sam Weiss and thanks him for helping her get her memories back. I, so she thinks yeah. it came from him, not the worms. I don't think it was the worms. I think the worms is definitely the bupkis science that doesn't actually work, but we'll we'll try it. We'll throw anything at the old chalkboard. It's so weird to me because there's a part of me that's, that's, you know, we've established so far that William Bell and Walter Bishop were so close, working on top of each other and doing mm -hmm. that, doing like that Mythbusters thing where they just build on top of each other ideas until like it gets crazy. All I could think of when that bell rang and she fainted was, so William Bell knows... Oh, that yeah. at some point, Walter Bishop is going to use a bell in his lab laboratory. Yes. And mm -hmm. that is what is going to trigger these memories because Bell has to find a trigger for Liv because she's not experiencing time in the right order. And he can already understand that. He already says it. He's like, oh, yeah, I experienced that when it first got here. It mm -hmm. was really bad for me. I can only imagine what it's like for you. But, you know, trust me, that kind of fades. And, yeah, you'll you'll be back in your time in no time. And, like, he rings this bell, and I'm like, so there are also piece of, pieces missing from her memories. Right. Where I'm just like, did he also, like, hypnotize you a little bit so that he could lock away these memories until a bell would ring and they would open up again? Like, Well, she entered a time slip, right? So yes. it's almost like she didn't have the memories yet because her future self goes back and then experiences them and then slips back forward, right? So oh. when she bust out of the windshield, she had she in the linear timeline had not done that yet. Mm. So oh. I think I think though Joy to your point, it wasn't the worms and it wasn't Sam Weiss. She was always going to enter the loop at that time. You're right. You're right. That's absolutely what it is. But I think it's a little, it's a bit of a loop. Future self, past self, mix up. Mm. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I like that because, like, that's so this show, though. <laughs> that's how I always understood it. I don't know if I'm right. Please I, don't at me, anyone. No, no I, I, I just, uh, if that's what they were implying, I, I completely dropped that hot potato. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know time entered into it at all. I thought it was just... Well, there are shape-shifting super soldiers looking for this information, so I don't want you to really have it on hand immediately. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that she lost time because she wasn't in the car, right? Right. No, right. she wasn't. She was out of the car mm -hmm. for, they don't actually say, but it's got to be at least for a couple hours because, like, they have to find Walter and Peter. They have to get them from Boston to New York, which we yeah. always are just like, yeah, that's just like an hour on the on the freaking highway. Yeah, sure. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, in the time slip of this show, Boston mm -hmm. and New York are like right there. Whatever. Let's say it's like two hours. So she she basically is missing for this point in time. She's not in the car. Mm -hmm. She's not anywhere. And then she ends up being thrown through this windshield. Yes. I like the idea that. Although now I'm just sitting here like, so is William Bell on the other side replacing the window on the building? <laughs> <In like a, laughs> yes. Is it? <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, 
I don't, I like the idea that like her consciousness would have traveled. Yes. I don't know. And that only one, there can only be, be, (laughs) and that there's only one version of her consciousness that can experience that loop. And then that, that's why she disappeared from the car. I'd honestly never thought about that. I had only thought that like these memories were locked away somewhere and Belle had them protected until (laughs) Walter Bishop inevitably hit a bell. Yeah, I mean, this isn't uh, this is based on literally the one line that William Bell drops where he says, oh, you're still adjusting to the time slips and how time passes differently between the two universes. And I was like, oh, okay." Hmm. (laughs) I like that idea. It's a great idea. I mean, do I trust that the show was doing that? Because, again, I have been trained by J.J. Abrams just to never trust that he's actually any good i mean i know it's not jj he's just the producer but like i feel like with these shows like we're really good at building up really fantastic fan theories Mm. that are never as complex (laughs) (laughs) it was just aliens (laughs) (laughs) i know the show has like i feel like the writers of the show have a lot of like (laughs) <laughs> like fanon about the show that they may or may not share in certain episodes and whether they tell you it's there or not like they have decided certain things about this show and they will not share them with the audience or yes. will they like it's a con- <laughs> it's a constant question <laughs> i mean look i will say this at least like this show was too early to fall into the game of thrones trap of oh no they figured it out and therefore we have to change everything Mm, Which, mm-hmm. what a stain upon the history of human entertainment that was. <laughs> Truly yeah. and sincerely. Yeah. That was uh, unfortunate. Well, anyway, well, so back to the anyway, show. Anyway, would, would you like to talk about the frozen heads, Nella? I know you had a lot of opinions. Okay, so, super soldiers. They're collecting cryogenic heads, and I'm actually shocked. Shocked! When I tell you I was really expecting the Disney comment and there wasn't one. And I'm so glad we didn't go for that. <laughs> I low was too. Fruit. I was really <gasps> expecting a comment about Walt Disney and we just didn't go there. And I was like, <laughs> look at that. Somebody knows a cheap to work joke in that town. They? Yeah. Well, <laughs> where were we at at Disney mergers at this time? Uh, <laughs> well, was the question is, was JJ still trying to get Star Wars at that time? Right? Ooh. ooh. Because if he was still trying to get Star Wars, well, was Star Wars even Disney at that time? I don't, there are timelines that I'm not. Oh, no, that's, that's going to be a, that's a, that's a dive. (laughs) As we weave this conspiracy theory around (laughs) him not making a single joke about it. (laughs) Not making a single joke about Walt Disney, whose head is likely frozen somewhere. But no, no, Nella, you had a different. It's not, it's not frozen. That's the thing. I know. <laughs> but anyway, so these the, the super soldiers, the one um, one guy who seems to have his, his stuff together and who uh, manages, to, manages to escape the cold open, whereas the other one gets riddled full of bullets and then bleeds mercury, mm-hmm. which I made a comment about how, oh, no, it was Alex Mack the whole time. But now after watching the Alex Mack uh, introduction again from 1994... I'm realizing that Alex Mack actually more turned into a water-like substance instead of mercury. So this is my own childhood memory, just misremembering. Uh, this is a deep cut I, for you millennials still, out there. I still maintain Alex Mack looked like mercury when she turned into water. I well, maintain. We, we really didn't have the water mechanics down in CGI in 94. Let's be honest. <laughs> We did not, so. but, it, but I'm pretty sure Peter also commented on the, like, he's going over there to check out Alex Mack, like, putting a thing. So, yeah, this was 100% for the millennials in the audience. <laughs> Shocked that Walter didn't try to lick Mercury, by the way. Uh, oh, that he actually put on gloves like a smile. I was waiting for the moment <laughs> where he did something dangerous with that Mercury, and it just didn't happen. And it just didn't happen. That's growth. But anyway, back to the heads. So... We're collecting these cryogenic heads and, you know, we're trying to find a thing in the heads. And now this whole scene is framed by uh, not Charlie uh, having his face melting off because he's dying because Mm -hmm. he he's his thing broke. 
and uh, it looks like these things are non-transferable. It's it's y- y- his bro can't just be like, oh yeah, just use mine. Let's just you know, <laughs> just just a I, very convenient mechanic that they've decided to throw into the sure, show. Sure, sure. Yeah. It is attuned um, to I each guess. individual sh- soldier. I guess. <laughs> I maybe. guess. <laughs> why? Why? If you were building an army, why would you only make a gun why? that only one soldier could use? It doesn't make because any it's sense. cool, Joy. Because it's cool. <laughs> It was sexy. Do you know how many billions we spend on fighter jets that don't even work? Like, we would 100% create an army of super soldiers that can transform themselves, but only with, like, one little box that no one else can use. Yep, that is specifically biolinked to you. <laughs> like, what if that fell in a, a, a civilian hands, and then I almost said Sicilian hands. And I was like, no, hang on. Um, <laughs> but what if that fell into c- I'm still trying to say Sicily um, what if that fell into c- civilian hands and then like people could transform themselves magically oh no, no it's almost because like because they're not hybrids they're not mecho organic creatures <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't pump mercury into your veins <laughs> Oh, well, when Charlie broke the, not Charlie, when not Charlie broke the thermometers and then drank yes, and all the mercury them. out of the yeah. slushy. Yeah. I did want him to make a mercury slushy mixture. He did not. He poured that slushy out first. What a waste. Mm. Well, what a waste of a slushy. What a monster. A real monster. <laughs> that not Charlie. I know. And how <laughs> dare, how dare he get one of the cutest Walter Charlie scenes. I'm so mad it's fake Charlie that got it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How dare. How dare they keep give him the cute Walter scene. <laughs> Wait, Can Noah, we... you still didn't talk about the, yeah, so back the to frozen the head. heads. <laughs> <laughs> Tangents, what are those? <laughs> so they're searching these heads, you know, kind of cutting up and cut, try, searching them for, and then none of them have the thing they're looking for, so they're tossing them over their shoulder hmm? in this clearing. And all I could think was, this is going to be the weirdest jar. archaeological excavation in, like, 500 to 1,000 years. Like, somebody is going to be digging around here for some uh, what weird reason. They're going to be like, why are there so many heads here? <laughs> why are there so many hens here? And it just made me think about how, like, <laughs> the thing about archaeology is that you only ever have, at best, the shadow of an answer Archaeology is the science of everything's made up and the points don't matter. (laughs) Especially when there is no written history, no oral history. When we have nothing, it's definitely Mm -hmm. always like, can we base it on pre-existing, like, modern communities? Or maybe, maybe we can't. Maybe we'll just (laughs) pretend. It's like those stories I always hear, which I always take with a grain of salt about those items that archaeologists have found in everyone's houses. And then they decide that these items must be of huge religious significance because they're in a prominent place in everyone's houses. And then some human with with a very specific area of expertise says, no, in fact, that is a common household object. And here is what it does. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) This is a spoon. They used it to serve lunch. <laughs> and, and it, it was so house. good at its job. <laughs> yeah. They put it in every house. No, that's that's a huge part of it. And like the joke is when you when you're getting drinks with other archaeologists is the joke is if you have no answer, just say it's a ritual purpose. Like <laughs> this is not good archaeology, but these are the jokes we have, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> gotta have jokes. Gotta find the joke. <laughs> gotta find the joke. I just I I I would have lost my gourd if I were in a site where I was uh, excavating and there were only skulls. Only would have skulls lost with it. like I guess the remnants of plastic because would the plastic have survived that long? Well, that's so, a great question. I don't know. Like, uh, have we hit an apocalypse where we finally um, have the plastic eating bacteria we're growing in labs of let loose oh. on the universe and? And suddenly plastics and ocean are long, long, well, but we're long gone. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Who yeah. knows? Who knows? <laughs> or maybe the other universe gets its way and this universe doesn't exist at all in the span of 10 years. Yeah. You know? So, by the way, that's our ticking time clock, everyone. Uh, in case you missed the memo, William Bell has warned us that we are leading up to the last great storm, mm-hmm. wherein our two universes 
Our Time two lines. snow globes will collide, <laughs> and only one survives the collision, and the other one reigns supreme. And the other and one will crack open. He thinks that they're going to collide once a door is opened between them, and then some some parts of them overlap, and they, quote, exist in the same space, even though doors have already been opened between them. Yes. Well, th- those were the previous doors. This is the one for the last great storm. <laughs> I wish our audience could see Danielle's door. face for that one. <laughs> Danielle was just like, but the doors have, they've already. Those were like they, little cat doors. We're talking like big, like, like. Barn like doors. Those, <laughs> yeah. And once they're open, you can't put the horses back in them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the horse is out of the stable. That's it. That's your done. Uppercase T, uppercase D, the door. I mean, the now, door. I'm just, now, now I'm just imagining full metal alchemist. Right. Like, that's, that's I was the just going to say. That's the door. That's the door. The door. <laughs> uh, have you heard about the door? <laughs> Do you think these events could be connected to the door? Can I just talk really quickly about um, the lab tech Brandon and massive dynamic? Yes, yes, I love Brandon. Yes, oh, Brandon okay. Is, he might be the MVP of these three episodes for me. Uh, it's not look, Rebecca. <sighs> no, Rebecca is pretty awesome. <laughs> No, Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca is the real MVP. <laughs> Brandon could have been the MVP if he wasn't in episode four. <laughs> if he was in episodes five and six, he would be the MVP, uh, <laughs> and that's how we'll we'll delineate. Uh, but I don't know. I just really like Brand- Brandon. He's uh, I like how he talks to Nina Sharp. It's not disrespectful, but it's definitely like, yeah, you hired me because I know my I know what I'm doing. Yeah, uh, we can really- give her access to the servers. The public servers. I know. Wait, oh, I died. I died. I died. I just love the. I just really want to impress this cute blonde. Uh, and, and I'm just a dude who's bad at security, and my boss is standing right there. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I did get uh, some <laughs> some Ezra feelings when Brandon was like, "I mean, all information is free." It's <laughs> like Nella, Nella has a character in a Star Trek RPG that was basically just like, let's just share all information all the time. Why would I keep it secret? And it's just like, because sometimes you have to keep it secret. State secrets. <laughs> uh, what the, what are those? This is the Federation. Here, Romulans. Oh, I was favorite. court-martialed. It was great. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> no, Brandon, Brendan is just like that. It's just like, a well, I mean, yeah, we can take care of this. It's so funny the way he brags about it, too, where it's just like, oh, yeah, I can set up a program and you could get you could get the results live. Just sync mm-hmm. it to your phone. <laughs> and, and Astrid is just this, is this? I think what she says is, is this Massive Dynamics private FTP information? Yeah. And I was like, you rat bastard. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he is the good. Way, the way her eyebrows shoot straight up when Olivia says, oh, yeah, that's what that is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Astrid's so excited to get her hands on it. <laughs> I just. I want to know what other. I want to know whether Astrid did a little snooping once she had access. I hope so. I mean, my fanon is that she, uh, <laughs> my fanon is that she tried to see what else was there and then maybe like hit a firewall or something. <laughs> you can't blame me for trying. <laughs> Brandon is definitely going to have to rewatch those like security safety protocol videos. He's going to have to do the whole training exercise, all like three hours of it all over again. Okay. So before we move on from episode four, should we discuss Rebecca? Yes. The real MVP. I love this actress also, and every time I see her, I'm just like, I'm so, so glad to see her. (laughs) But she is, you know, she is this figure who I think the only person we've seen so far who has experienced Walter in both settings and not been horribly traumatized by him or, like, (laughs) forgotten about or... (laughs) Who has positive memories of him. Yes. Yes. Who has positive memories of Walter Shocking. Bishop? <laughs> the only one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. So far, we haven't gotten to talk to William Bell about Walter yet. I'm sure that William Bell has positive memories of Walter, but I mean, William Bell is that's equally true. monstrous. So I don't know if it really counts. <laughs> Two monsters talking about each other, being like, "I mean, he's not that bad." <laughs> Whatever. But anyway, Rebecca. 
Yeah, no, I I really love Rebecca. Rebecca's just there to look. Rebecca's just there to get stoned. Let's just call <laughs> it how it is. She's just like you know, I miss this. <laughs> I miss being so high that I saw a world that no one else gets to see. (laughs) There's Rebecca. (laughs) Yes, that is Rebecca in Technicolor. Uh, And I I love that we also get that little tidbit of, you know, whenever I see someone from the other world, they kind of glow. And Mm. it happens twice in this episode where she was like, well, when you were a little kid... You know, when she's talking to Peter, oh, you were a little kid and I could have sworn I saw. And then the drugs kick in and she doesn't get mm-hmm. to finish her sentence. Mm-hmm. And then when she's coming down off the drugs, which, by the way, she was just cleared to drive. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, uh... He injected her with something to counteract them. No big. <laughs> no. She's still seeing glowing people. <laughs> that was just the sun right behind him. Right behind him. Like, right behind him. <laughs> right behind him. <laughs> Reflecting off his mercury-driven hair. No, he's not a super soldier. It's fine. No. But yeah, it's it's definitely a, must just be the drugs, which is my other, like, favorite line that she has. Yes. Oh, must just be the drugs. I did like that Walter actually apologizes Yes. For his actions where the the episode doesn't specifically say, but there's definitely a they probably had a very inappropriate relationship. It doesn't specifically say that they were romantically involved or that anything actually happened. All we have of her in college is a video (laughs) of her in the 70s just uh, blitzed out of her mind talking about alternate realities and soldiers and things. And then we have the way they interact as adults, which uh, there's, there's the slight imp- implication that they could have had a fling. Maybe it's so unclear though, because even as she kisses him at the end of the episode, she says, I've been wanting to do that for a long time. So the question is, is a long time since that morning or is a long time since she was a college student? I yeah it it was kind of unclear. Was <laughs> there was they there, didn't there, is it. The, there was also a joke about like her knowing where he keeps his slippers. <laughs> yes, a little bit. She gives just a funny little bit of a look. <laughs> she gives she gives a little bit of a look, and I was just like, does she know where does his she slippers know? are? <laughs> and is it because they're just tucked away in a corner of the lab where he likes to hide things, or it's, is it because they is were it on top of the microwave? someone's bedroom? <laughs> You know, <laughs> is it on top of the microwave because he's an eccentric? <laughs> right. And I don't know. Anyway. Hmm. Thoughts. <laughs> but yeah, I love her so much. I don't know what it is exactly. I don't know why. She's just Every- so warm. <laughs> She's a warm, inviting person. Yes. And yeah. she lights up the screen when she is on it. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Something about her vibe. Something I mean, about her vibe. She left and she had a great life, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, unlike the other examples we've seen. She was one of the lucky ones. (laughs) True. So she's almost like a breath of fresh air, too. Yes. Uh. We haven't we haven't seen someone this well adjusted to experiences with Walter Bishop. Hey, we have a woman who like wasn't tortured. How about that? Ah, How about how do you like them apples? I love them. I want more of them. (laughs) Give me all of these apples. I'll bake them into a pie. I'll be a delicious, delicious woman loving pie. <laughs> That's where we went with that. <laughs> what flavor is woman loving pie? Oh, uh, no. There's probably some rhubarb in there. Probably be peaches. No, it's definitely a peach based pie. My 100%. brain went immediately to peaches as well. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. I'm so glad we all could arrive at this. <laughs> we could experience this moment together. That we can experience okay, wait, this. Can moment you make together. a peach rhubarb pie? Hang on, is rhubarb something you could put in with peaches? I've had oh, rhubarb no. and strawberries. Speaking, I know of strawberries that's the usual. Yet again. But I feel but now like, we're, yes. we're off of strawberries now. No, thank you. No, you can. You can one hundred percent make a peach rhubarb pie. All right, I will have to try this. <laughs> Summer project. <laughs> that could be a really tasty pie, actually. Well, okay, before we totally turn off of episode four, I think probably my other favorite moment of from episode four is when Olivia just rips William Bell a new one at the end of the episode. Yes. 
I mean, a yeah. hard left turn there because this is a woman who definitely has trauma because she was tortured by these individuals. I hated the cutesy thing he did with the tea and the warmth and, oh, yes. you used to call me Willem and this reunion and it's going to be lovely. And I love that she called him out on it. Yeah. Immediately. I agree. But I, that's why casting Leonard Nimoy is so choice because <laughs> he is your internet grandpa. And you're just like, no, 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 no. Let us examine what you have done. It's good. The, like the extremely charismatic older uncle who just, you know, speaks of of honey and sweet things and all these other things. And it's like, yeah, but um, your actions, sir. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a good point. It would be so easy to just accept everything he said because he always finds a way to twist it, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like when she's referring to the victims of the experiments or the survivors. And he just says, oh, you know, and any search of knowledge, there are unintended consequences. And you're like, ooh. William yeah. Bell basically does what she did with Sam Weiss when she was just like, you're going to, you know, cut the Yoda crap. Like, you're going to talk to me straight. You're going to tell me what's happening. Just say what you have to say. You pulled me into this reality to tell me something. Mm -hmm. And he and does. And that is finally <laughs> when we get the explanation about the storm and uppercase T, uppercase D, the door. <laughs> just going to run around shouting about the door. Have you heard the good news about the door today? <laughs> it's going to set us free from our mortal coil. I really appreciate that the show doesn't shy away from showing how strong Liv is. Mm -hmm. Like, Olivia Dunham is the, arguably the strongest character they have. Strong 100%. of will and strong of, like, just thinks about everything and puts, like, not only puts the pieces together visually, but also mentally. And, like, she's able to make all the different connections that we all right. need. Excellent detective and police officer, just everything that she does. Yeah. And what I love about that, too, is that we do a lot of these moments of just emotion. Because by episode five, after she shoots fake Charlie, which, <sighs> look, I have issue with the fact that um, she shoots fake Charlie. And while we know it was, in fact, fake Charlie, the best she has, hey, let's unpack that psychologically, is Sam Weiss. Royals, we really need to have like an on staff psychologist to help with this. Swear jar. I know this is the. I know this is the FBI, and we're bad at this. But oh my lord. Well, also the FBI fringe division is bad yes. at this. They're really bad at this. They're really <laughs> bad at this. What they needed was like Nina Sharp to have some therapists on call to be like, hey, you've seen some stuff at Massive Dynamic, right? Have you talked to like your people? <laughs> okay, Do you no. Have after uh, recommending Samwise, I'm pretty sure Nina's the kind of person who's like, have you tried, I don't know, a jade egg? I, I don't know if I trust <laughs> Nina Sharp's, like, mental or physical recommendations for health. I definitely <laughs> don't trust the FBI because they're the ones who sent Stern in there to be like, you guys are crazy. Why are you talking about psychedelic frogs and butterflies? I know. <laughs> what are we? <laughs> so because the, the FBI is... doesn't have it either. <laughs> No. Nope. So the answer is everyone's bad at addressing mental health. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Great. And she can't talk to a therapist who is not involved in any of it because what is she going to tell them? Right. Literally nothing. She's yeah. going to have to make up nonsense and they're going to be like, you're lying to me. And it's like, yeah, I actually am because I can't tell you. <laughs> right. Or she'll walk in and she'll share as real as she can. A friend who was extremely dear to me has died and I'm in mourning. Yeah. How did your friend die? I can't answer that. Not important. Yeah. <laughs> Were you involved in any way? Can't answer that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the person of interest problem where it's just like, do you <laughs> understand what survivor's guilt is? It's when you survive a tragedy that you had nothing to do with and you somehow feel responsible. And meanwhile, Harold Finch is like, I was responsible. <laughs> Don't tell me I wasn't responsible. I was responsible. <laughs> you know, it's that problem. I want there to be therapists really, really badly. <laughs> but at least in this show, it's not a, it, there's a reason to like not go to therapy <laughs> because right. it would be super difficult to talk to someone about any of the problems they have. I, d I like I also like you watch shows like how to get away with murder and it's like all y'all need therapy real hard and you could get it. 
Like you could mm. get it for everything you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, yes and no, because they wouldn't be able to share their number one secret that is really eating away at their hearts. In yes, that show. but they could share. They could share <laughs> like eighty percent of everything else. <laughs> They could be like, so I'm having this weird relationship with this woman and, like, I'm pretty sure we hate each other. Like, that could be talked about with a therapist to unpack. But on the other hand, you have Olivia where it's just like, I can't say anything. Because if she literally tells anybody connected to the FBI, they're going to think she's crazy. And you're right. Sam Weiss is like Nina's only option because I Mm -hmm. guarantee you Nina would have given her someone else if she didn't think Sam could help her. Sam, just, I'm not gonna let myself go on another another Sam rant. <laughs> Instead, we're just you. we're just going to smash cut right from that character to a character I love, which is Agent Kashner. Why not? Yeah, this poor gullible boy who they decide <sighs> is competent enough to be left alone with Walter for long stretches of time. I, I think someone was asleep at the wheel at that point, but uh, Charlie <laughs> had just been killed, you know, or Charlie's death had just been discovered. So mm-hmm. I would, you know. Actually, before we get off Charlie real quick, where is his wife and all this? Good question, Joy. I, mean, I would love to know because he had a life and a family and things that mattered. And <laughs> and I guess they don't anymore or something. It's so sad. I guess. I mean, where's Olivia's sister? Where's Olivia's niece? Like, all of these extra side characters mm-hmm. were just dropped. Yeah. I know. Where's Meghan Markle? <laughs> I did actually write down, like, what happened to Meghan Markle? I love... Okay, so, full disclosure, listeners, I really don't like episodes five and six. They're probably my least favorite in the entire series, which is kind of saying something, considering what season four and season five are. So... <laughs> Take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But the things that I do love about them are, you know, like episode five, we get to have like Peter and Walter have their house and have their home. (gasps) And like you, you plucked Walter out of this comfort zone when he was just getting used to like having a, having a home base and brought him to Seattle, which is very far away from his home. Mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a mess the entire time. He's extremely anxious and he's scared. And you brought him to a hospital, which triggered his anxiety about St. Clair's. Well, especially when the person in the hospital bed was strapped all the way in. Yes. And he did not want to go into the room and, and eventually forced himself into the room because something happened. But the, the thing I really enjoyed about that was he voiced his concerns to Peter. And at first, Peter was like... I promise you we didn't leave the oven on. (laughs) We've never turned on the oven. There's no way it could be on. We Mm -hmm. locked all the doors. We, Mm -hmm. like, we took care of everything. Don't worry about it. And then Walter pushes a little bit harder and is just like, I really am uncomfortable and I really need to go home. I enjoy that step that they took as a father and son, where before it was just like Walter would just get really angry at him and become really distraught. And now it's like we're using our words. <laughs> we're using our words to, to, to say we're uncomfortable. But then, of course, he gives him this uh, agent cash. <laughs> Bless. Bless. Bless this. Who, our third blonde hair, bl- blonde haired, blue eyed character. Who? <laughs> yes, Nella was immediately suspicious. No. <laughs> Will it, in fact, be three for three? I mean, we actually don't know. What happened to Agent Kashner at the end of this episode? He's just gone. He's kind of just gone. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like the show's going to throw us a lot more blonde hair, blue eyed guys that could be baddies. So the CIA <laughs> agent, I think, at the end at of like episode Sandy, six, Sandy blonde hair. <laughs> yeah, Sandy blonde hair, definitely blue eyed. Mm-hmm, definitely mm-hmm. has some tricks up his sleeve. That guy. We're going to have this conversation in the middle of the street. Yeah, that guy. (laughs) I'm going to approach you after you left your ex's house. For some reason, (laughs) I know precisely where you were going to be this evening. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The biggest thing I don't like about episodes five and six is because the thing we mentioned before is they feel like filler, but they also feel like (sighs) they feel like lazy writing. They they feel very weirdly two dimensional. Like episode six is like, oh, guess what? It's aliens. Surprise. Mm-hmm. And like episode five is like this weird interpretation of what it's like to be an addict. 
Yeah. I didn't, mm, I don't really cotton yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. They both are really like addiction allegories in a way. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And bad ones. Bad Very ones. bad ones, might I say. Very bad ones. And I mean, I know the odds weren't exactly like, look, the odds weren't a great place for mental health either. You know, there was a whole a whole discussion in our country about like how to deal with how to deal with 9-11, even continuing past that. And like the younger generation was saying therapy and the older generation was like, well, we didn't get therapy when we saw a million people die on TV. And it's just like, yeah, maybe that means something. It was just so reductive. And I didn't like it. I just want to say my favorite parts of both episodes. Um, yeah, in please. Episode five. We have the the big bad is um, a doctor who has been implanting chips in people's brains to help them sleep because they're insomniacs. But he can tap into that, spoilers, and ride the high of like other people's dreams. But he's doing this when people are awake and they go mad with like seeing demons and, and pretty much they are triggered into having dreams while awake. And because of that, uh, they are monstrous and they're nightmares and then their brains can't handle it and they die from fright. What I love (laughs) is that there is a waitress in a restaurant Mm -hmm. (laughs) who suddenly sees body parts are being served. Like there's body parts on the grill and that's the monstrous thing she sees. And instead of screaming, she just grabs a knife and I'm just like... This is some Buffy the Vampire Slayer fantasy she has where all like the look on her face isn't even horror. It's just like res- resignation. Like, guess I got to go kill some demon George jar. Like right. it is the <laughs> wildest thing to see. Can I go I'm kill some cannibals? Shocked, shocked that she actually dies from this because I'm like, I feel like this woman has very specific nightmares that she can actually handle quite well. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know, you know, I have to say, I don't really understand the whole, the quote, heavy quotes, science behind this episode, because according to Walter, they weren't dying from fright. They were dying from acute exhaustion yeah, and something about doesn't... the way that the dreams were siphoned off from their consciousness meant that their brains never got to rest or reset. And I was like, yes, but then don't make their hair turn white. What exactly? Don't, like, don't what make happened? their hair turn white, because that is the classic. He died of fright. Friends, I like I <laughs> I like he died from fright so much more than he died from acute exhaustion. Right? It just doesn't make sense to me. Wait, no let's sense. go back and forth. Favorite moments. Mine is smaller. Episode okay. five. Favorite moment when Walter gets a housewarming present from Astrid. Yes, that is pretty delightful. <laughs> yes. And he smells it and he identifies it as. Ciabatta. <laughs> Ciabatta bread. Yes, exactly. And, and like, of course, oh Astrid gosh, is so like, <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> and there's a the moment where he's sitting on the bed, like looking at the loaf, and he goes, do I eat it or keep it? <laughs> <laughs> I liked that Olivia knew she had to deal with her trauma, mm-hmm. and she eventually does. Yeah. There's one thing that the show does well, which is they usually tend to show injuries in a more realistic basis of them healing. They don't really do that with trauma, though. They did the thing that most television shows do where they're like, we're going to talk about it in this one episode and then we're never going to talk about it again. I mean, at least it's better than original Star Trek, where it's just like, oh, Oh, I know. So you've been mind raped by your your co-employee in an alternate universe. Don't worry about it. And no, we're never going to talk it's about fine it. Bones. It's fine bones. It's fine bones. Never going to talk about, about it. it. Yeah. At least we talk. At least Liv had to. I mean, she had the moment where she goes to his grave, and then she realizes that the thing she's picked out is the thing he told her on their first sting operation together, which is yeah. you're going to be fine. And then she has herself a good cry and keeps calm and carries keeps, on because she's keeps Liv. on trucking. <laughs> what about episode six? Oh, I have I have some favorite moments in episode six. I'll tell you my least favorite moment. The teaser Ooh. starts with murder butterflies, and I got mad because those were a lie. <laughs> well, the, oh. the last time on. The last, the last time, time on the starts last with time on. And I'm just like, don't bring murder butterflies back into this. Yeah. You bastards. Oh, I really didn't like the I didn't did not like the opening 
for this for episode six at all. I hate the setup where, you know, she walks in and she's going to be so excited because she realizes immediately it's a surprise and it's an anniversary dinner. And then she approaches him and then, oh, I know. No, I hate I hate it that as well, because like you think like. Well, if this is the movie Contagion, then this is like, well, he's a cheating cheater who cheats and he's lying. Right. And then it turns out, oh, no, he's not lying. There oh, was no, a good really... 30 seconds of Nella being like, she's a cheater. He's a cheater. Who's cheating? <laughs> <laughs> and then, no, they, they're actually just two people who honestly do love each other and no one deserves to die at the end. How dare you? It also you? gave me, and I'm not going to spoil the moment, but some, some Buffy vibes. Some real Buffy vibes uh-huh. in that opening. Yes. <laughs> yes. Everyone who's seen the show the knows what I'm talking you're about. You're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I Although do, in fact, are... know the moment you're talking about. Yes. Although there was one moment where um, this was, I'm pretty sure this was just bad continuity. So he moves <laughs> the flowers to the hallway, and then there's a shot of her coming home, and you can see the flowers in the kitchen. And I'm pretty sure that's a bad continuity shot, not that oh. like we're we're seeing into the, some weird alternate reality thing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I definitely had to sit there with a minute with it. Like, was that important or was that just bad continuity? I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's bad continuity. <laughs> <laughs> the show makes you look at every single possible frame and then it's like, was it a flub? Was it reasonable? I don't know. Yeah. Was it a time slip or was it a did time someone slip? edit this incorrectly? <laughs> um, I enjoy how this episode made me look up how many languages use Cyrillic letters. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I was like, my favorite part of this episode was watching Nella's reaction to be like, you know, it's not just Russia. <laughs> well, because they, they find something with, they find a piece of hardware with Cyrillic mm-hmm. letters on it. And Peter goes, oh, we know he's Russian. And I'm like, we know he purchased Russian made materials. And while we do understand that he's probably Eastern European, we we don't really know that he's Russian. Mm-mm. There's a lot of other things he could be and he could just have bought russian made stuff because of the very specific thing he needs to do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but uh well, we won't yeah. look too deeply into that yeah well, this is you- another one of those and he's russian i guess uh, <laughs> cold war i really enjoyed how much this this serial killer was Broyles' man who got away i could just hear the yes. judy garland in the background like mm-hmm. As he's listening to the recording of, of the last phone call he had with him. This was a great Broyles episode. I also like that we got to see Broyles and Broyles and Olivia working yes. together quite a bit in this episode, since Peter was mostly sequestered with Walter and Astrid in the lab. Yeah. yeah. I think my favorite moment, fun moment, my favorite fun moment in this episode is also a Broyles moment, is which it- is when he's at the, res- at, when he's at the restaurant. <laughs> That's mine too! <laughs> It is. And then it's really our first hint that, you know, Broyles has a life outside of this. I know, shocker, but hear me out. He had a wife and he had a family. He had kids and he he really lost them because of the toll this case took on his life. And it's and at the end of the episode, what I do like is that he's still on a kind of status with his ex-wife where he can go to her house in the middle of the night and her new husband is there. And they just have a conversation, you know, it's it's not toxic, it's not antagonistic, but he just wants her to know, like, that case, it, we got it, we mm-hmm. did it, you know? And she's yeah, she, genuinely happy for him, and then yeah. afterwards invites him in for dinner in what looks like a really sincere invitation. Like, yeah. oh, hey, do you want to yeah. come in and have dinner with us? And, and it is you just know, that heartbreak declines. of, like, sometimes, like, you know, the relationships you have uh, don't last. Mm-hmm. And I like that we see Broyles like, yes, like, uh, you know, the show says, well, he, this marriage fell apart because of this case. But it seems like the marriage fell apart because sometimes that's what relationships do. Right. And he is still able to have a relationship with them and his and his kids. And like, it, yeah, it's it's not what it was. But I did like seeing that, like, just because he had the divorce, it wasn't antagonistic at this point. Like, whatever bad feelings had been, whatever caused the divorce, like, they just, they did, were able to move on. And I really Mm -hmm. enjoyed seeing that, brief Mm -hmm. though it was. Because now he could go live a weird sex life with Nina or something. And then we all, everyone's happy. (laughs) My beautiful little black dress. (laughs) Involved with everyone. She has a very busy life, that Nina. (laughs) 
Uh, but I just had to like this. The thing I hated the most about episode six is um, I hated the sense that we've introduced aliens and they don't matter. I hate that. I actually hate that. And I looked across. I looked at Joy across the room, and I was like, uh, "I'm going to say it right here, right now, that this is the last time aliens will ever be mentioned or discussed in the Fringe series. I will put money on it." <laughs> Do it now. I'm going to put a whole $5 on we are never, ever, ever. <laughs> it's never going to be aliens ever again. $5. <laughs> $5. I was going to ask, you know, how confident you are about this. Like, is it you would put double the tip jar amount confident or is it? <laughs> oh, no, please. I'm not made of that much money. <laughs> I know I'm getting a raise in July, but I'm not made of that much money. God, no. Not that confident. It's a hefty although, tip jar. <laughs> although, the fact that a fact that you had mentioned that makes me think that I'm on the right track on this. Because I don't well, feel I said, you I said would. tip jar, but I meant swear jar. I don't know, Danielle. Would you, would you make me have to pay that much money? <laughs> For a good cause, mind you. For a good but, cause. But would you make me? Would if you I made me? you do it, I would end. I would end up splitting it with you. You know, no. <laughs> you know. I am not a betting person, even you though I, me. I. I mean, I we could just round it up to six, and then we all donate. <laughs> <laughs> we just all split it three ways. Um, you know, I feel like I have to make this declaration now while we're in the episode, and I feel pressured to do it. All right. You know what? Yeah, I will match the swear jar in donation. To a to a uh, charity that supports young black women in STEM, on the assurance <laughs> that n- aliens will never be a plot point again in this Georgia show. <laughs> I love that. I think that bold declaration is an excellent way to end this podcast episode. Do we all agree? I agree. <laughs> okay, for amazing. sure. Listeners, please send us your thoughts and your feelings. <laughs> and no spoils about the aliens. If they come no for me, they'll they'll come. Again, no spoilers yeah, no, do to not Nella. spoil. Do not spoil. <laughs> With everything other than spoilers, we would love to hear from you. Please check us out at Binge O'Clock Pod on Twitter and Facebook, where you can answer the question, if you had to drink blended flatworms, what would be your mixer of choice? You can email us at bingeclockpod at gmail.com. We also have a Patreon. Find us at patreon.com slash bockpod. That's right. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your loved ones. Tell the gullible FBI agents in your life about Binge O'Clock, and we will see you next time. It would be those weird super berries that change the flavor of things. I would mm. eat one of those and then take the the worm shot. <laughs> That's what I would It wouldn't do. be the chaser? No, 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 no. The berry would be the chaser to coat my mouth so that when the worms hit it, the flavor is different. I don't know how it would change the flavor. It could make it worse, but it's it's better than <laughs> strawberries. Ah. <laughs> And then maybe tequila. To, maybe tequila. I was going to say because the miracle berry will change the flavor of the worms, but they will not, in fact, change that texture that we no, were I know. discussing. Well, the thing is, you just got to get the texture, out, like, and then, and then I'm thinking tequila to wash it out. Perfect. <laughs> okay. I almost paused for Nella's verbal tweet, but then I didn't. And then I was like, oh, no, she's going to still have an answer. Oh, no. <laughs> you should always assume I have a verbal tweet coming in hot no matter what. <laughs> the hottest oh, of takes for our questions. All right. I'm, uh, I'm hitting end, though. <laughs> <laughs>